Brilliant. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, apologies for the slight delay. Had a few technical issues um, getting the chair on board. So, so yeah, um, welcome to the uh, action workshop on carbon footprinting, first steps for small businesses. Um, I've been dipping in and out of the conference um, all day and seen some fantastic content, some fantastic speakers. So I'm sure you've all had a, um, a great day's worth of value and a great day's worth of content. So hopefully I can uh, keep that keep that rolling. Um, so before we start, just a little bit of an introduction to me. Um, so Paul Gilbert, um, uh, background is an apprentice trained, worked my, most of my life in electronics manufacturing. Um, and now I work for the Southwest Manufacturing Advisory Service as their low carbon expert. So my journey to this role was basically um, working with um, engineering and production companies. And then I had the option about uh, in the early 90s to, to move away and do something different. And I got into sustainability and sort of low carbon support. So, so it's fantastic to be with you today. I've um, got a broad background in, in sort of low carbon, carbon footprinting and general sustainability. So really looking forward to, to this session. Um, in terms of because it's a, uh, a virtual session, it'd be really useful if I could um, find out a little bit about you. So I'm gonna, gonna run a couple of polls. So the first one, which I'll just be running now, is I just need you to sort of tell me or vote against which of your, um, which best describes your business sector. Now, unfortunately we can only have four options. So the options are retail, manufacturing, construction, or if not, other. If you do put other, it'd be great if you could just pop in the chat um, what those sectors are, um, because then the, at least I know sort of who we've got in the audience and I can uh, try and steer the content in that direction. So it, it looks like we've got quite a few ticking other. So if you can just let me know in the chat what those are, that would be great. I'll just give you a few more seconds to, to finish that poll. Oh, sorry, in the in the Q and A is where you um, tell me that the uh, what the, the the sector is. So, and then I can see it on my screen here. So that's great. Brilliantly. Also, as you um, sort of describe your business sector, be really good. Um, for me to know sort of what size of business you are. So another quick poll, just so I get a feeling for how large um, your business is. So again, so I can sort of um, fine tweak some of the content as we go. Um, but my, my understanding is it's gonna be um, sort of smaller businesses, um, but we'll see. So okay, so, um, so medium size and um, yeah, a few small businesses, um, but a few in the sort of 20 to 50 bracket. Brilliant, many thanks for that. As we go through, just feel free, um, use the sort of Q&A function, um, just to drop me notes, add comments, um, put in, yep, so we've got sort of healthcare, residential, and we've got museums, yeah, I thought we'd have retail and hospitality, so that's great. So yeah, as we go through, I have put um, specific slides in place to allow us to have a bit of a chat and you give me some feedback, because obviously, even though it's um, virtual, I just want this to be as interactive as we can. So as we go through, there are opportunities um, to do that. So so moving on, thanks for that. At least I know sort of who I've got in the audience, and I can now sort of tweak it accordingly. So we're gonna be running through, um, carbon footprinting and it really is just just some sort of basic um, steps we've only got like a, um, just under an hour to run through it so it's not going to be too in-depth not going to be too technical but what I hope it gives you is a real starting point and and really a, a place where you can sort of take some actions um, later on today and really get cracking with your own footprint so we're going to look at why we should even be bothering we're then going to move on to sort of what are the recognized standards for, for carbon footprinting then going to talk about something called scope and boundaries, which before you start is a very important um, stage of, of setting your, your carbon footprint because you've got to know what you're, what you're trying to measure. Then we're going to move on to data collection and I'm going to talk you through where you find this data, where you can pull it from a business so that you can then start to um, develop it into your carbon footprint. 
We're then going to talk about how you actually physically calculate it. And then once you've got it calculated, we're going to talk about really, will you will you decide to, to one, verify it, which is, is sort of quite recommended, and then will you publicize it um, to your customers, your, um, your wider world? And then lastly, and really for me, it's the most important one is, is, is taking action. I want this to be an action workshop. I want us to have action during it, but most of all, I want action after it. So it's all for you to um, sort of take action with what you've learned and what you've found out. So, so in terms of why footprint, has a couple of quotes to get us started. Most people probably have, have heard the first one by Deming. You can't measure, you can't manage what you don't measure, which is very true. An extension of that is actually generally, if you can't measure it, you probably can't manage it. And things that you do measure tend to improve anyway. Um, so I did a project ooh, several years ago, and it was looking at a new technology um, to, uh, to to basically get a, a gas boiler firing more efficiently using sort of magnet technology. Nobody really knew it, if it worked or not. But actually, in just the company measuring their gas use, and in, and um, it actually showed an improvement already before anything had been fitted. So um, just before we move on, I think um, Steve's joined us. So if Steve wants to say a quick hello. Hi, Paul. Sorry about that. Uh, I hope you can uh, see me and hear me now. Um, had a connection problem. I don't know why, because I was watching the sessions this morning. Um, so welcome and many thanks for starting without me. Um, sorry you had to do that. Um, I'm Steve Child, one of the uh, lecturers in operations management from the business school. Um, and uh, what I prepared to say was that uh, we've heard a lot about climate change from the scientists and we really need to develop the agenda for businesses because it's business that needs to react and do some things about it and uh, first steps in footprinting is uh, one of those ideal ways forward so i'll not take up any more of your time i'll, I'll speak to you at the end paul thanks very much brilliant thank you steve um so yeah sorry i think i left the poll on but um I think that's now gone in the poll has disappeared. Yeah, I think it's gone. So, um, so yeah, moving on in terms of sort of why footprint, if you imagine you're on a journey, your company's on a journey to get towards net zero, um, you to be on any journey, you've got to know where you're starting. Um, so, so it's a good point to get a, a line in the sand to establish where your baseline is as a company, what your carbon, um, sort of missions are and as I said in often just gathering the data you'll you'll find some opportunities for improvement I'll give you a few sort of quite shocking examples of my experience of just gathering energy bills and vehicle bills and what we actually found um, I'm a great believer in sort of making decisions on facts and not feelings so so data gathering allows us to do just that we can actually start to make business decisions based on um, actual evidence um, and although at the moment um, we've got um, mainly sort of small to medium enterprises in, in, the, in the audience, in the group today, and it's only the larger companies that are mandated um, at the moment to measure and report their carbon footprint. But I'm sure as time goes on, as we progress as a country and, a, and, a, and as, a, as a global entity towards net zero, I'm sure that pressure is going to increase. So it's, it's probably likely that the, that the pressure will come down the supply chain and head towards the smaller companies at some stage. So it's better to be ready now. And as you'll see, there's big ben benefits to be to be taken from, from as we go. So just a bit of um, discussion now. I'm really interested in sort of why, I guess, why you're here and what why you're interested in footprinting and what's sort of driving you to to start your journey of get, gaining a carbon footprint so if you can um just let us know that in the in the in the um, discussion board that'd be great and what i'm really looking forward is to see whether it's is it your is it your supply chain is it your customers that, that's driving you or is it just personal is it your staff that are interested in in carbon footprint um, are you doing it because you just feel that you, you you owe it to the next generation we're just waiting for those answers to come through
there's always a slight delay as we as we collect the um, discussion but what I'll do as they come in I'll um, just keep moving on and we can I can see the sort of um, the reasons come in as we go so okay so we've got someone that um, very aware of climate change doing masters so that's that's the sort of driver of being here wanted to do the carbon footprint gave a presentation this morning to a group of manufacturing companies and a lot of those um, uh, companies actually felt they owed it to the next generation um, and they were finding a lot of pressure from their employees so I think whatever your your reason for looking at carbon footprinting um, it's just use that as a basis from where your company's gonna sort of head so in terms of now taking these first steps towards getting our carbon footprint first thing you've got to do as business is decide which footprint you're going to try and measure and actually what standard are you going to adopt if you are going to adopt a um, recognized standard so in terms of your options of carbon footprint there's two uh, basic options to you you can do your organizational or company carbon footprint or you can actually look at your product or service in more of a life cycle um, scenario where you're looking at the full life cycle cost which would more be a prior a product footprint in terms of today as I said it's simple it's first steps so I would urge anyone taking their first steps in carbon footprint focus on your own business first get your own house in order and also as you'll see it's fairly simple to generate um, a basic company um, organizational footprint it becomes a little bit more complicated when you move into product footprint so given the time restraints this afternoon um, we'll be we'll be just sticking with um, carbon footprints for businesses and companies at the moment. So we now know which footprint we're going to do. We now have to think about okay, which which standards are are we going to adopt? Um, yeah, we've got some more other other drivers for for some of the delegates out there. So we're currently looking at updating environmental policy and putting into company plans and targets. And then we've also got part of our advice to to institutions. So so thank you for those drivers um, in terms of standards probably the most globally recognized one is the greenhouse gas protocol um, standard which is sort of where it all started um, it's a great site if you need um, resources um, toolkits um, full of information full of standards full of guidance um, it has got some calculation tools and we're going to look at one of those briefly um, a bit later on provide online training really link you up to where the world is going um, in terms of um, carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions so a real wealth of a wealth of um, data and resources and widely recognized um, across the globe if you want to go to an internationally recognized one then there are two ISO standards um, so the first one is 1464 and that is for the organizational company level carbon footprint so that ISO standard would, would basically drive your business on exactly how to measure it what to count how to verify it, and then how to publish it. Um, and you can get that, as we'll talk in a minute, you can get that externally verified um, by an independent third party because it's a written standard against which you can check. Similarly with ISO standards, there's 1467, and that is for the product carbon footprint. So that's more about the life cycle thinking in terms of sort of what materials have gone into that product, what manufacturing process, how is it distributed, what is the carbon um, impact in use, and then finally, sort of what, what happens when it when it goes to end of life landfill or does it get reused? Is it a circular economy type product that you're doing? Again, ISO standards will give you sort of almost line by line um, methods and methodologies and frameworks to follow. Then the last um, really sort of globally recognized one is PAS 2050. Um, and that's more, again, linked to products and services, um, so carbon footprint. Any of those standards, um, it's, it's sort of your choice which which one you choose. They're all broadly, you'd like, you're pleased to know, broadly aligned, but with obviously their, their, their slight differences. Um, the GHE, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, is probably the biggest, um, most commonly um, recognized standard without going to a, a full, fully fledged ISO or, or PAS standard. So we now know um, which print we're gonna do. We're gonna do a company footprint We've decided that we, for this presentation, we're gonna be using the greenhouse gas principles as we go through. So we now to need to think about what we call scopes and boundaries. So this is setting out how far in our business are we gonna measure? Um, and then also in terms of boundaries, if we've got multiple sites. So in terms of scopes, the greenhouse gas protocol um, currently gives us three um, possible scopes to look at. Scope one 
is your direct emissions from your business site and those are direct emissions from your business activities so so if you imagine i think we've got a museum in the audience so so you may well have gas central heating um, boilers they will be burning gas and emitting um, carbon directly into the atmosphere um, you may have if you got, got some other companies that may be so in healthcare, residential care so we've got central heating systems again if they're using gas or oil then it will be a direct carbon emission um, from your site so it'd be classed as scope one the other direct emission is if you've got company vehicles traveling around unless they're 100 percent electric they will have direct emissions um, as they burn the fuel so the greenhouse gas protocol re refers to these two as static and mobile combustion so if you think of that if you're burning anything on site then there's a direct um, emission third one a little bit more complicated um, we will be looking at it in a minute is something called sort of process or fugitive emissions these are emissions from um, you know, typically uh, greenhouse gases um, contained within air conditioning units um, large chillers um, so if you are, if the, the, depending on the size of the museum, if you are running big air conditioning units, there's a chance that you will be um, needed to look at fugitive emissions from your, your kit and equipment. Um, don't worry, we're going to look at these in a little bit more detail as we go. Then we move on to scope two, um, which is which your emissions that are indirect, but are 100% through your control. So you've got electricity that you're pulling into your 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 business, your museum or your care home. So that electricity generation will in itself carry a carbon burden unless it's a 100% green tariff. Um, I don't think we've got anybody in the audience that this, this affects, but some companies actually pull in external heat or external cooling or steam supplies. So that has a downstream um, carbon generation emission. The third scope is where it starts to get quite complicated. That's where you're sort of indirect emissions through your value chain, so through your supply chain, so materials, employee commuting, waste management, water and effluent. And really scope three is, 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 is quite a big step in terms of technical um, complexity. In, the good news though, in terms of doing a carbon footprint for the business, we only have to worry about scope one and scope two um, under the greenhouse gas protocol. And really I think what you'll see as we go through, you will, if this is your first venture into carbon footprint, you'll start here, but very soon you will start looking at scope three because that's where a lot of your carbon reduction can actually come from. Then lastly, around setting the boundaries um, is something called organizational boundaries. So if you've got multiple sites, you need to decide which sites are within your control and which sites you're going to pull in to your um, carbon footprint. So the greenhouse gas protocol gives us two options, really. One's called the control approach. So if you control um, operations, at various sites then you can choose to pull those ones where you've got the majority of control or well, the other one is is whether you've got ownership so the equity share um, it'd be interesting in a minute um, you can you can sort of start to um, give me some feedback in terms of whether organizational boundaries is is a is an issue for you or whether you've just got one single site so if you'd like to use the um, discussion function now and then just have you got any questions around scope one and scope two and are your business boundaries going to be quite simple or have you got potentially complicated sites um, to worry about? we we'll just wait for the information to come in. I'm hoping that most people have got single sites and I'm not hoping for any hugely technical questions on scope one and scope two, but if there are I'm more than happy to, to deal with them. If I can't answer a question today, then I'm more than happy to, you, you'll have my contact details and you can, you can sort of follow up, but I'll see what is coming through in a few seconds on the um, discussion panel.
Great. So um, first one is simple, simple. So brilliant. Uh, very pleased. Um, as I said, I've, I've aimed this at being basically fairly basic, fairly simple to follow. Um, so we'll keep in that vein. Single site. Great. So moving on um, in terms of the sort of next step is is now we know where the boundaries are we've sort of defined what our carbon footprint is going to be we now need to start to gather the data um, so so this is just a practical way of where to find the data and quite often what the data can tell us when we when we when we go and find it so scope one um, you remember is uh, emissions on site from combustion on site and fuel um, burnt through your vehicles so so where to look really mains gas quite simple uh, dig out your gas bill and your gas bill will show you um, if you've got more than one meter it'll have multiple meters on it but this is just a simple example from our gas meter um, shows you the period of usage and then critically it shows you the kilowatt hours of gas that you've actually used so the units of gas so when we come to the calculation phase we need to know that unit of gas because there's a direct correlation to units of um, carbon or carbon equivalent um, gases in burning that gas so go okay, quite simple dig out your gas bill as I said sometimes in just gathering data you'll be amazed at what you find and when I did this with a company 10 years ago they had three meters allegedly and when we looked at it only two of them were in their site the third one was next door to their business so for about 10 years they've been paying next door's gas bill um, so just in that one moment company saved sort of hundreds of pounds a year so so gas fairly simple and equally if you do have um, sort of off gas so oil um, oil or LPG again you'll have um, a delivery a delivery note which will tell you the volume of oil that they've delivered so from that volume you can then work out how much you've used in that given period so not not too complicated to to work out and then sort of nearly third one is company vehicles um, this really depends on how you operate company vehicles within your business um, what we do is each one of our team uh, complete a expense sheet which shows mileage so our accounts team then gather that up on mass at the end of each month and then for each vehicle I've gone on to the government um, database and from the MOT checker you can find out the emissions for that vehicle so we're able to equate very closely the emissions for each one of our staff um, you can choose in the greenhouse gas protocol it'll allow you to choose sort of small medium and large vehicle you can choose small van large van high cider um, so if you don't run expenses then the next place to look at is maintenance logs um, for your vehicle so wherever whenever that that vehicle gets serviced it will show you what mileage has been covered and obviously if it's a business vehicle you can then equate what mileage it has done you'll know the fuel it's using whether it's diesel whether it's LPG whether it's um, unleaded and then you can equate the carbon from it um, it gets a little bit more complicated obviously for electric vehicles because at source they will have zero emissions um, so that would come down to like an indirect emission because of the electricity used to recharge the vehicle but um, mainly the gas bills the oil bills and the vehicle uh, bills are fairly easy to easy to gather we mentioned these things earlier called fugitive emissions and these are from typically the larger air conditioning plants um, larger freezer cabinets so I see we've got some um, hospitality uh, businesses in the audience but if you are using a big walk-in freezer there's a chance that the compressor and the um, the, uh, the, the heat exchanger will be using um, sort of, uh, greenhouse gases in the in the system so what you need to do there is just just when you get the system maintained typically you'll get a what they call an F gas um, service sheet which tells you various things tells you the condition of the unit it tells you whether there's any visible leaks but critically if it, it, the, the technician can actually see whether they the unit needs topping up or regassing um, if it does need regassing then they will tell you the actual quantity the kilograms of gas that they've put back into your system so again we've then got an identified value which the, we can then apply a carbon coefficient to at the next stage um, when we start to calculate it so 
So that's um, stage um, for sort of scope one. So what I wanted to sort of understand was really um, in terms of another uh, another sort of um, question for you is is sort of do you think it's going to be easy to find that data? And in your business, do you know who's going to be responsible? So who who are you going to go and try and find to get that data from? So if you could just let us know in the poll, that'd be great. Because quite often, it depends on the size of your business. I would imagine, I mean, we've got a guest house owner in the audience, so I'd imagine that, that owner pays the bills, receives the bills, opens the bills, be it an email or paper form, so they're going to have the data. Whereas um, we've got a museum, so there's a chance that they're going to have an administration function, possibly a finance function. So, so it's for you to think about how easy it is going to be to get that scope one data. Who holds the information? And then we know where to start looking for the for the information. So, yeah. So yeah, it looks easy for a small company on one site. Um, so that's, that's very much true. Um, I actually thought that for us, um, but I've quickly run into some quite complicated areas uh, because a lot of our team work from home, and whilst we've reduced our mileage dramatically in the last year because of lockdown we now have a conundrum of actually remote sessions do have a carbon burden in the cloud so um there's i'll be doing some further research on, on where we how we allocate the carbon from our activity online but also how we act how we allocate the the carbon emissions from our team working from home but we're only a small business so i don't want to do it very complicated and as you'll see later on, when we when we look at getting carbon footprints validated, so long as you're transparent with the way you've approached it and your methodologies, so long as they stand up a bit of rigor, a bit of scientific rigor, then it's fine for you to choose your way you're going to do it. So I'm probably going to do it on a very simplified way of a typical home carbon footprint and allocate a percentage of that for home working. Because we know in our business, our biggest carbon footprint, it will be um, traveling and staff travel. So... Okay, so we've got a question about, I've never seen small freezers checked. Um, what happens if they are not? Um, so yeah, small freezers don't come under the FGAS regulation. Um, so typically you'll, you'll sort of know a small freezer is has been leaking when the um, compressor finally rattles to a stop. So if it's critical to your business, I would be getting it um, just regularly serviced. Like you do your car, you need to know that that's, that's in good condition. So. Um, it's not if for a small freezer. It's not a huge, huge cost, and it's and you'll actually find it'll add to your energy efficiency anyway. So we're going to be talking about freezers and chillers in a minute, and how you can make them more efficient. So, so thank you for that. Um, some interesting um, insights again. So we then move on to scope two, and this is for your electricity. Um, and again, this this is where we've seen people paying electricity for for meters they don't own. Um, so two things on your electricity bill you need to look at. Um, I don't know how big your screen is, but the top bubble, I don't know if you can see, but it, it shows what tariff this user is on. And this is an EDF bill, and they do 100% blue tariff, which is 100% guaranteed green electricity. So if we know that, actually, that electricity has got no, it's got zero carbon emissions. So technically, for our footprint, it's not going to add to our footprint. But critically, we still need to calculate it because we still want to reduce our energy usage because it, it gets us to much more towards this sort of one planet thinking, gets us much more in the in the, in the in the vein of reducing and improving our business performance from an environmental point of view. Similarly with the gas bill, the lower section of the, the bill um, shows you your actual meter usage in kilowatt hours, and that's the figure that we need to grab for our scope two emissions. Um, just quickly, a poll that I'll be running now um, is is whether how many of you know what your tariff actually is. So whether your whether you know your energy tariff or not. So three choices really. You, you guaranteed it's one hundred percent green. You might think it's got a mix of fuels, or actually we don't know. So if we can uh, if we can vote on that. So we've already got some people with. 100% green, which is great. Just 
to let the other votes roll in. So, so I'm pleased that they, we've got people in the audience that have one, identified their bill, two, identified their tariff, and even better, it's 100% green. So um, sometimes you do need to do a little bit more research on, on the green, and we've got a few that, yeah, have got a mixed um, tariff, which is not unusual, and then some that don't know. So so it's useful just to um, to do that um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a starting point um, because it's important for your um, carbon footprint. And one very quick win in terms of reducing your carbon emissions is to switch tariff so you can move from a mixed tariff of, of fuel sources to 100 percent green and you immediately reduce your um, carbon footprint down so i'm going to remember to close the poll this time so that it doesn't stay on your screen and then go back to the q a so that i can sort of track what people are saying so and then we've got data is easy to find pending on which office as we have direct decision making for our ownership office i rented having landlord supplies for our utilities great so Great, so we've got some um, good bits on data collection then. So moving on, we've now, this is a recap, we've decided what footprint we're doing, we've set our boundaries, we've identified the scopes, we've now gathered the data. What we now need to do is, is number crunch this data. And this is where you've got a range of options. Um, as we'll see, there is, a, there is a huge plethora of carbon calculators out globally. Um, I've got no allegiance to any, um, so I'm just going to run you through some sort of fairly um, fairly robust ones, fairly common ones that we see, and then just spend a little bit talking about the one that we're going to be using for our own net zero program with our own manufacturing clients, just because it does give you some sort of advantages. So your first option, really, if you've got someone in the business that's pretty good on Excel, is you can crunch the data yourself. So you can work out your bills, work out your usage, glean your carbon coefficients from the um, GHG site or the government um, coefficient site, which is fairly easy to do, um, and then put the data in, press the button, and it will tell you your, your carbon footprint. That's fine if you're a small business, fairly, fairly simple, but the trouble with the data coefficients, they do tend to change as, as the mix of fuels on, on electricity generation changes, so will the, um, the bur carbon burden for those tariffs. Um, and some things change over time. So if you are going to do it yourself, you need to factor in how you're going to keep that data up together and how you're going to keep it um, sort of up to date and easy to manage. So um, another option, um, most people probably would have heard the Carbon Trust, um, big energy um, reduction um, program that I used to work alongside when I worked for EnviroWise. This was our sister company. We did waste and water, carbon trusted energy. They've got um, a couple of great tools. They've got a very, very simple tool. Um, but ironically, it's almost too simple. Uh, it doesn't really give you much meaningful data to make some decisions on that we're gonna be talking about in a minute. Um, but do they do have some quite good um, information for small and medium sized business in terms of carbon footprinting. So, so well worth a look. Next one, as I said, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol have just launched a beta um, example of a carbon footprint. Um, my personal view is that it's a little bit too um, detailed and a bit too technical, as you can sort of see just from the landing page. Um, we've got a lot of tabs. We've got a lot of quite complicated language, um, and it's, it's basically Excel driven. So it's quite a complicated beast um, to input your data, but it's free and it is very thorough. Um, and it's basically, you know, you're getting it from the source um, of where most of the carbon footprinting um, protocols come from. So third option is a carbonfootprint.com and they do carbon footprint tools. They do free versions um, and they do um, sort of elite versions and, and um, sort of deluxe versions. Um, yeah, just another um, simple, simple to use tool um, gives you some advantages. You don't have to worry about updating it. Um, tend to be not Excel driven, um, so they're more user interface. It can get some nice um, sort of evidence and outputs from them. Um, for us, uh, we're going to touch on our Make It Net Zero program very briefly at the end because we've got no manufacturers, so so it's not really of interest to you. But what might be is that we've we've chosen to um, use a tool called CBN Expert, which for us gives us some nice. Um, benefits. So you can see on the home screen there, we've got selectable intensity metrics. So you can make your own intensity metrics. So for the museum, you could have a carbon per 
per visitor metric or you if you're the guest house you could have a carbon per per um, night stayed metric so you can start to equate it back to your business um, but the biggest one for, well, two biggest reasons for us is it for us is very visual so it's a very visual um, output a very visual dashboard very simple to use um, but with us it gives us the ability of actually running a community so anybody that joins our program their data will be, be stored in CBN expert and we can aggregate it up to a community level of SWIMAS um, but back down to the individual level for the company and each set of data is, is completely independent as I say I'm not here to um, recommend or promote any one system this is the system that we've just chosen um, so far early days we're getting some good feedback from from um, the team and from the users so any questions on carbon calculators before we move on Take, I'll take that as a no. If I see any pop in, I will um, sort of come back to calculators. But if there are any questions, then um, feel free to, to pop them in as we move on. We're doing fine for time, so there's no great wash, but rush, but there's nothing worse than sitting, waiting in silence. Um, gone are the old days when we'd have people shouting from the audience and hands going up in the air. So, um, But yeah, thank you for that. So now the next stage you've really got to think about is having calculated it, sort of, are you going to get it verified? Um, so I'm going to sort of talk through the, the pros and cons of, um, well, the pros of verification. And also once you've got it verified, are you then going to publicize it? How are you going to publicize it um, within your business? So in terms of verification, if you do get it independently verified, it really does sort of build credibility into your footprint. It adds a degree of transparency. If you're going to use it with your suppliers and your customers and your supply chain, it just it just gives you that, that sort of confidence. Um, and also in terms of business reputation, if you're going to publicize it and if there's a chance it's going to be scrutinized either by the media or by your competition, then getting it verified by an independent body gives you that confidence that it will stand up that rigor. It's gone through that rigor. Therefore, if it did come to it, you can you can sort of defend your your corner um, and challenge your competition or the media if you need to. And I think there has been some interesting um, challenges this week on some quite high profile firms. So then in the options really of verification is quick Google search and there's umpteen ways that you can get your carbon footprint verified. Almost everyone who provides a carbon footprint calculator will provide a verification service as well. And we said about the international standards, so the ISOs and the PAS 2050s, they will all be verified or be able to be verified by a UCAS accredited company such as BSI, SGS, um, LRQA, there's loads of companies and literally that's why I've put the Google search in the, in the, in the middle is, is basically it, in terms of verification it's up to you who you choose to verify it. We have linked with Carbon um, Expert, CBN Expert, because it has a back end of a verification system through um, a team called Future Net Zero, which is part of the Race to Zero, it's part of one of the partners. So for us, it presents a very low cost, low barrier verification um, method for um, a small sort of company um, but it's up to you who you use um, everyone's got a cost um, but and sometimes you can actually get them verified through um, graduate um, programs through some universities so that's that's worth looking at as well so so now we've got it verified i don't think we've got any more oh yeah so no questions that's fine um, so now we've had it verified we're, if we've had it verified, we've got some confidence and we're comfortable with the data. Now's the time. Are we going to push the button and actually publish it? And how are we going to publish it? And sort of to who are we going to publish it? So I'm just going to give you some sort of um, quick examples of, of sort of three companies. Unfortunately, they are all larger companies because when you try and find published data from smaller companies, it tends to be a little bit more buried and a little bit more inaccessible. Um, way to access so hopefully this will give you an idea of if you're going to publish it the, um, the sort of better ways to do it so um, firstly this is Amazon's um, published footprint so very sort of 
very very sort of technical just numbers but interestingly down the bottom it does show us the way that they've approached it so they've published their methodology and they've published um, the person or the team that verified it and at a glance you can see their, their total global footprint so nothing wrong with that data at all but you may want to depending on your business is present it in a much more interactive way for your customers for your stakeholders for your maybe your employees so this is um, you probably know the brand quite well um, Pakati this is very on brand for them and they've they've used quite a clever infographic to represent the carbon footprint of a cup of tea and as as we probably know um, the lion's share of that carbon footprint is in the boil in the kettle to make the tea but I think you 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 get the difference between that and Amazon's that for me is much more engaging I wanted to learn I want to look at it whereas Amazon's I was just like okay let's glance over it um, then thirdly again using infographics using graphics this is Ford's sort of sustainability journey so they're, they're turning it away more more about the wider sustainability picture but within that you'll be publishing your carbon footprint so think about how you're going to publicize your hard work and your results um, so any any thoughts on verification and publication before we move on to the final step so i don't think so but i'll keep my eye on it i know steve will keep his eye on the um, discussion so if you do have one pop in we can we can quickly come back to it You might want to see competitors before you publish. Yeah, good point. Let's <laughs> see what they're doing before you go you go live. So um, I always say one step ahead. So thank you. Um, for me, this is the most important step. It's great to calculate a carbon footprint. It's great to verify. It's great to publish it. But if you do nothing with it, what was the point of doing it? So for me, it's all about taking action. And I just found this this quote, which I just I thought was brilliant. An inch of motivation will bring you closer to your goals than a mile of intention. So um, I'm really all about action. This is an action workshop. So I just wanted to take a little bit of time to talk us through how we use our carbon footprint to take action on our business to minimize, decarbonize our, our business going forward. So, so the way we approach life is very much start from the top and drill your way through the data. So if you've analyzed your carbon footprint, and in this example, electricity is the biggest portion of the emissions. That means that we can then focus on it. If we can halve that, we get a very good win. If we chose to focus on the yellow section, fuel oil, if we halve that, it's almost negligible. So, so go for the big chunky bits of your carbon footprint first. Start from the top, drill down, and then for energy, this is just a just an example because obviously we're biased to manufacturing companies, but this could equally be a museum, could equally be hospitality. Looking at that energy usage, the lion's share of that energy usage is used in heating and air conditioning and power and then heating and cooling. So immediately we can start focusing our efforts on where we're going. So we don't want to be focusing on, for this business, in process electricity because we're um, we're only going to have 6% total impact. Whereas here, we've got 60% of the footprint is in these two areas. So almost just like bird's eye view, keep drilling down into the data. So now what I would do is, okay, I'll look at this HVAC power one, 35%. What makes up that? Where are the big usage? Where are the, where are the big machines that are using that power? Why are they using them? Are some of the machines way out of maintenance? Are some of the machines struggling? Should we be replacing some of the machines with more modern units? So just drill down into your into your data to get to the actual um, sort of root cause of the of the issue of where that where the big emissions are coming from. Um, in terms of you making quick wins, these are a little bit biased towards manufacturing, but I'll try and pull them back to sort of offices and and hospitality museums. Complete an energy audit. So just walk around your site, walk around your site, looking. What can you see? What can you hear? Are heating fans running? Are our lights being left on, our machines running when they're when they're not used. Um, if you've got energy being used in switches, a very simple way is just color code switches to aid the control and management. 
So I've seen typically a green switch. If it's green, anybody can touch it, anybody can turn it off. If it's orange, you might want to just check with someone whether you turn it off or not. And then if it's red, don't turn that off. I've had it before where someone turned off a server overnight and a business got itself into a right pickle the next morning. So, so think about that before you're gonna start rolling out energy production. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of technology you can use. Um, so sensors, I added a, a toilet at home, um, which has got no windows. So I deliberately put a, a passive infrared sensor. So as I enter the loo, the light comes on. As I leave, the light switches off 10 seconds after. So I'll never have to worry about leaving that light on because it could easily be on left on all day if I don't go back in and um, use the main bathroom. So um, if you've got um, energy saving functions, in your technology so either in your dishwashers in your washing machines in your computers make sure that you're enabling it within the within the um, function of the uh, the machine of the, of the product and then if you haven't done so already probably the easiest win is on lighting um, switch to energy saving low low energy LED lighting um, but generally for small businesses you'd only do that as a maintenance as a replacement exercise but nowadays even that depending on the age of your current lighting you can get business payback very quickly so um for those that use compressed air it's a biggie um, for energy reduction um, because a very expensive way of, of generating um sort of energy and resources is compressed air so so check for leaks i'm not going to dwell on that because we've got sort of not many manufacturers here um refrigeration we said um check the seals of your fridge check the seals of your freezer in the, we had a question about it's a small freezer so it probably doesn't get looked at for gas leaks but just check the back of the freezer check the heat exchanger if it's covered in fluff and dust that heat exchanger is going to be working really hard to do its job if it's working hard the compressor is going to be using a lot of energy so clean it general maintenance freezer management thinking if you have got walk-in freezers think about how you can minimize the amount of times they go in and the classic for me and this will apply to a lot of people is how often do we have aircon units running windows open or how often do we have the heating full blast and all the windows open because it's too hot so think about your energy control and also think about energy control over the week so if you don't use the space at weekends can you shut down the um, heating system so it's only running monday to friday the last two really is the fugitive emissions um, which is down to maintenance of of your equipment that, that gives rise to those emissions um, fire suppression systems don't don't worry that's not just standard fire and smoke detectors that's the that's the more um, chunkier um, type of systems that, that would actually suppress the fire so business travel a whole lot of options you can do you can look at um, uh, use of digital platforms like today saves us all traveling in um, you can plan your routes much better um, you can incentivize your, your your team to use a cleaner feet and you can switch to electric. So we're um, quite proud now that we've got two of our guys and they're 100 percent electric as their visiting clients. So that was a great, great swap. Now that we've got those actions, get them down on a plan. And that becomes then the building block for the next step, which is it's a classic cycle of plan, do, check, act. So you've got your plan action those things on your plan review how you got on and then following that review you might just want to modify your actions so there's another activity there's another set of actions and then just keep going around that loop again and again so it's all about using your data to drive decisions develop some actions check those actions and then go back around the loop again really importantly celebrate with your team and success if you are publicizing your carbon footprint um, celebrate it with your customers celebrate it with the outside world and that does two things really it really helps engage your team um, gets the high, high, much higher levels of engagement um, and really starts to embed this culture of of sort of carbon reduction decarbonization in your business um, in terms of regular reviews what i would suggest is you review your footprint aligned with your energy bills and your gas bills so if you're on a quarterly billing do it every three months if you're on a monthly billing do it every month um, just keeps the data collection to a minimum um, and just keeps your data live because the more often you review it, the better it's going to be. Um, so just really nearly drawing us to a close, really, what I want to find out is this is an action workshop. Um, so just using the discussion panel, if you could just tell me sort of what is your first step going to be and commit to me when it's going to be. It could be just a very small actionable step that you're going to do following today. 
and then once we've got those um, I will just just very briefly talk about the net zero program that we're running for about 10 seconds and then we are almost coming to an end so I think we're nicely on time so I'll just allow you a couple of minutes to tell me what your actions are to make sure that we've um, made this an action workshop and it really is if it can be any step that you want big small and different um, but just for me any small step is a step towards the where we're going people are thinking about their actions so whilst you whilst you think about them because we can come back to the chat at the end just briefly, if you know any manufacturers in your business community, we are basically there to support our manufacturing base in the Southwest to get to net zero um, by 2050, at least, if not before. So we've got a five um, year program now, fully funded to help companies get towards net zero, but you have to be a manufacturer and you have to be located in the Southwest. So if you know of anyone, then just steer them towards us for that support because it is a challenge for everyone. So, um, thank you for thank you for um, your attendance. Thank you for your feedback and your input. Um, we're done now, so we're just going to look at the sort of who's taking what actions. What have we got, Steve? That's coming. Yeah, look, if I can just uh, speak up and say thank you very much, Paul. I thought that was very interesting, and you've done you absolutely hit the spot with looking at the first steps that companies. Uh, can take and I, I just wonder if I might ask a question in a, a chairmanly manner um, I just wondered if you could say something about what other problems that SMEs face because you've made it seem quite easy to get started but what is stopping everyone from doing this I, th I think um, Steve it's basically not knowing that there's a structure and that there are defined scopes to stick to so our first pilot in our net zero program three months ago, the guy had actually got quite far in carbon footprinting, but he'd got himself tangled up in trying to work out the carbon coefficients of resins. And he had 15 different resins, but actually what we did for his business carbon footprint is just rolled him back and just said, it's actually quite simple on the first step. So I think that's what's stopping him. It's, it's seen as a very complicated beast, but actually for your first part, it can be quite simple. Yeah, that, that's, that's good. Um, and I wonder if uh, you could say something about the, um, we call it scope three, the indirect um, carbon that's embedded in purchasing. And the reason I'm, I'm just interested in this is I saw some figures a while ago that came from the NHS. Um, and you think, oh, NHS, what do we know about that? Well, hospitals are overheated. It must be the massive heating bill. But it's not. That's actually not the biggest by a long way um, something like three quarters was in procurement and the biggest element in that was purchasing drugs pharmaceuticals have got the the carbon emissions that have gone into producing them um, yeah. so yeah um, we've done interestingly pre swimmers did some work with Envirowise with um, a few of the NHS trusts and the way they procure is quite interesting or was quite interesting and it was it was just down to um, down to sellotape for example almost each ward was buying their own sellotape so when we walked around everybody had six rolls of sellotape in their drawer so when you when you then start stacking that up to drugs and it's no wonder that the um, major part of the footprint is in is in materials and drugs potentially are very carbon intensive because of the processes mm -hmm. um, but yeah scope three is all around that carbon intensity of materials supply um, I've just seen we just had a question about is there an equivalent support program for other sectors um, not that I know of, but there is low carbon Devon that is obviously running um, that, that, that could well help um, businesses sort of get on the on the path to carbon footprinting. There are some programs coming through, um, but at the moment, none that I know. So, yeah, I, I think for that it might be a good idea to look around the exhibition hall. Um, good point. <laughs> in, in this very conference, because there are a lot of different agencies there uh, who can talk to people, and you can get in touch with them. Through this very conference tool, uh, if it works for you. Yeah. Brilliant. Any final questions for anyone? It 
looks as though you've answered all the questions. Brilliant. Many thanks, so, everyone. Thank you, Steve, for sharing. Let's close with a uh, big thanks to you, Paul. And I'd Good like pleasure. to mention that uh, the day is not over because after a quick break to look at the networking and the uh, what we call the trade show um, on that link, um, this evening at half past, well, half past four this afternoon, we're showing the film Eight Billion Angels with a discussion afterwards uh, with one of the filmmakers. So that might be uh, quite interesting and thought provoking for people to have a look at. So uh, that's about it for this session. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. For Pleasure. Part. And thanks enormously to Kaylee for rescuing me when I couldn't get in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think a big thanks to all the, the events team behind the scenes. They've been fantastic for me. So, yeah. Pat on the back for all the big round of applause. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>